Good morning. I will call the July 5th, 2022 City Council meeting to order. I'm going to ask Councilman Dodd to lead us in invocation and pledge. If you will please stand. for the family and the Norris Lord that lost a loved one. We just ask continue to pray for our country, Lord. Lord, we ask you to give us the knowledge, the wisdom to make the right decision for our city. We ask a special prayer for our mayor and our city council this morning. And Lord, let's not forget about the citizen of this great city that we live in. There's all these things in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. All right, item three is roll call. Marquise, you see all members are present with the exception of council members Pickens and Pretty. Item four is approval of the minutes from the June 7th council meeting and the special call meetings from June 14th and the 21st. I think those, meet, those minutes were emailed out to council. So if there are no additions or corrections to the minutes, then they will stand approved as read. We have a couple of recognitions and proclamations today. So I'm going to head down to the podium. But I want to recognize Chris Stewart. Could come up front. We got something for you, Chris. And so we're winning the design contest for the new flag. Presenting Chris with a one thousand dollar check for his design. August 12th, Carl Perkins Civic Center, we will reveal our and unveil the new city flag design, so you got to be there to see it. Next up, we have a proclamation. If I would have our gold medalist from our Special Olympics come forward, please. Her family. So today's proclamation reads, whereas Megan Roeder has been a Special Olympic athlete in Tennessee from Southwest Region Area 11 for 15 years. Whereas Megan became a qualified candidate to participate in the USA Special Olympic Games 2022 in Orlando, Florida by competing in local and state level competitions, which granted her the opportunity for her name to be put in a drawing among hundreds of Tennessee athletes to compete nationally. Whereas the Lift Wellness Center of Jackson, Tennessee gifted Megan a lifetime membership where she trained for several months with Jamal Brady of Better Balanced Sport and Fitness Foundation inside and outside of the pool. She gained strength, agility, built muscle, and long-lasting relationships with the staff members and anyone she's come in contact with. Whereas Megan was transported by Kevin Duggan, pilot and owner of Jet Shades, she left from the Special Olympics airlift in Smyrna, Tennessee to Orlando, Florida on June 4, 2022, returning on June 12th. Textron Aviation sponsored Megan's flight as well as hundreds of other athletes and delegates around the world. 
Megan is now a gold medalist. She received first place on June 8, 2022 in the 25-yard backstroke with a record time of 31.52. On June 10th, Megan placed second in the 4x25 freestyle relay with a record time of 1.52 and sixth place in the 25-yard freestyle on June 7th. Whereas she is dedicated to swimming, but also enjoys dancing, meeting new people, playing games, and doing word puzzles. Megan especially enjoyed her experience at Disney's Magic Kingdom and the Animal Kingdom, as well as staying at the All-Star Resort Complimentary Special Olympics USA Games host partners. Now, therefore, I, Scott Conger, Mayor of the City of Jackson, Tennessee, do hereby proclaim today, July 5th, as Megan Roeder Day. <laughs> Kind of dumb in the meeting now. It's going to be, yep, okay. All right. Uh, next up on our recognitions and proclamation, we have a presentation from Friends of Heart. I think I called Caitlin Roach. Oh, there you are. We'll provide a presentation. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so I am, as uh, Mayor Conger just said, the uh, executive director of Friends of Heart. We are a cardiac health nonprofit that does work all throughout West Tennessee, um, predominantly AED placements, um, things like that, so that we are um, ha make sure that areas are prepared for when sudden cardiac arrest happens. Um, many of you are probably familiar with our Four Minute City Initiative. That's definitely our biggest project right now. And the reason I'm here today is because I wanted to ask each of you to please help us reach people in your districts to make sure that we have volunteers for our care team. We are going to be giving them this new AED technology. They're smaller, they're more portable, they are um, going to be provided freely by Friends of Heart and our care team through Jackson Fire Department. Those volunteers are who is going to respond when we have a sudden cardiac arrest in addition to fire and EMS. We're talking about you're in a one mile radius, you're gonna get that call um, when your device goes off, your phone goes off and get uh, these volunteers to um, these victims in those moments because for every moment you're down in a sudden cardiac arrest, that's like a 10% chance you're not gonna survive for every minute that, that you're down. And in Jackson, for some perspective, in the city limits, we have about 100 of those a year and we only have a 6% or six people survival rate. So it is absolutely critical that we get shocks on hearts sooner and that is what we're doing here by being the first four minute city. It's a huge honor um, Been we've appreciated so much our partnership with the city. Uh, you're going to purchase some devices, what, what we've got going on here, but I've got some areas of town that definitely need more volunteers, uh, particularly South Jackson and East Jackson. Um, anybody that you can put me in contact with church groups, civic groups, I've been those spoken at business meetings. That's my main plea is helping us get this word out. I've found that when you can speak to people about the program, let them dialogue and ask you questions, they're a lot more likely to sign up because they understand what it is you're asking of them and what that commitment is and what it isn't. And uh, we, we really just need that. And I feel like you all know your district, you know the people in them better than anybody and can really, really help that make that happen. So that's what I'm here to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank any, you. Any questions Thank for Caitlin? Any questions? Appreciate the, the support from Friends of Heart for our parks. I believe last year there were some donations to many of our park facilities to have be able to have rapid response there. So Absolutely. thank you for the work that y'all are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. All right, item six is invitation for public comment. Anyone wishing to speak in under any item under first reading? When we get to that moment, uh, we'll call for the public hearing. Raise your hand, be recognized, ask that you come forward. 
have a seat at one of the chairs. Uh, start with your name and address, and then you can address the council under the item under first reading. We get to first reading, item one, consideration of an ordinance to rezone property located at Epperson Drive from RS, single family residential district, to RS1, single family residential district comprising of 18.5 acres more or less. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you have the materials pertinent to this rezoning request. Uh, it was presented to the Planning Commission at their last meeting, and they are recommending it to you. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. All right, before we get to the public comment, any questions from Council to staff about the request? Uh, Mr. Mr. Pilot, um, is this rezoning request for the total acreage that will be under development? Uh, it's mostly the area that will be under development for the uh, subdivision there is one out parcel that's beyond the creek on the old Humboldt Road side that will be an out parcel okay. all right any other questions from council all right this is an item on first reading so I'll open up the public hearing anyone wishing to speak in favor of or opposition to be recognized at this time all right My name is Steve Neal. My wife Margaret and I own and live at 15 Rockwood Drive in the North Point Lake subdivision. Um, Mayor Conger, our city council, men and women, I want to thank you for the chance to speak today. Uh, I'm here on behalf of our homeowners association to ask for your assistance with the rezoning plan that's on the table today. Uh, we want our city to use responsible planning for the residents of our area of North Jackson and any future Jackson development. Okay. Uh, about three years ago, my wife and I uh, stumbled across North Point Lake. It's beautiful, a couple of lots left, we bought one of them. Had a conversation on that lot with one of the developers of this pr uh, proposed subdivision, Kenny Sutherland. We asked about the development of the adjoining property at, qu in, uh, at question today. He said, it's probably at some point going to be developed, okay? There's an approved plat already on the books with the city, okay? That plat shows uh, plans for uh, maybe approximately 35 homes and two access points from the stub in our subdivision, which is uh, an Epperson stub, to a Epperson stub in the North Point subdivision. It's already been approved. Um, if my memory serves me correctly, we, we kind of joked about it. You know, Kenny, I know, I've known Kenny a long time. Uh, he said, you know, right now she wants too much money for that property. We can't make it work financially. Okay, but at some point in time, it will be developed. So myself, my wife, many of the people in this room made decisions to purchase property in this subdivision knowing that we, we might have this meeting at some point in time. Okay. Uh, we as a group, we're not against develop, uh, development in the, in the city of Jackson. We're not opposed to building houses for, um, for the growth in our city. You know, we, we want our city to grow. We want industry. We want commerce. Uh, we want it to be grown the right way, okay? And so uh, I appreciate Kenny coming to our homeowners association and letting us know about three months ago exactly what their plans were. To make the money work for them, they need to build more houses. They need to go from the, the, the mid-30 house number to about 48 houses, just to make it beneficial to them um, to make this work financially. We understand that, okay? But the main change that they wanted to make was is to go from two access points to one, okay? It makes absolutely no sense. If you use common sense and look at this map, it makes no sense at all, okay? So, so what do we do? Why, we ask them, why one access point, okay? If my memory serves me correctly, they gave me three reasons. Number one, financial, okay? It just doesn't make sense for us to cut an access point on Old Humboldt Road. We can't make the money work. I get it. Why would I work and make to, to, to develop property and not make money? I get that part of it, okay? Uh, it's not financially feasible for us to do that, okay? Even if it were, 
even if they were just made of money and had plenty of money to spend, there were two other main reasons. They said, listen, Steve, this is not going to work for us. And here they are. We were told that JEA could not provide them with assistance needed because of what is called a blue line ditch. Okay? I, I've never heard of a blue line ditch. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it means. Okay? But evidently that causes a problem. Now, uh, some smarter people than me that are over here behind me that are residents of our subdivision reached out to JEA and said, listen, explain this to us. Is this a problem? Can this be done? All right, we were told by JEA contact that this can be done. They are willing to work with any developer, not just them, but any developer to make this work if they want to put a, an access point on Old Humboldt Road. And when you look at it, that's, it makes sense. That's where you should put it, okay? They're telling us you can't do it because of, it's like it's a, a plague or something. Well, we can't do it because it's a blue line ditch. End of the story. That's not the, that's not the case. We were told by JEA it is possible. The second thing, we were also told um, that there's a landowner on the opposite side of Old Humboldt Road, okay? We were told, all right, that the landowner would not grant an easement to tap into the city services that are already there, the sewage and water. We can't do it because he won't work with us, okay? One of my fine friends back here has talked to the landowner who lives out of state, and he says, listen, I'm willing to work with the city. I'm willing to do this. I don't know where you got that. So we were told one thing, and the landowner is telling us another thing, okay? So, again, we're not opposed uh, to, to development in the city of Jackson. Uh, that's not our point. What we are opposed to is the one access point. A couple of quick po points, and I'll be done. All of you have a map up there, and I'm sure you've glanced at it. If you look at that map, you'll see North Point, North Point Lake, Enclave, and Shallow Springs. There are currently only two access points into these, this collection of subdivisions where there's probably 250 or maybe 300 homes, two ins and outs, okay? If, if you vote on this rezoning as it's been presented, you're going to add another 48 homes to that, that situation right there. Uh, this also results in in a total of 90 residents being forced to use one traffic path. That's North Point Lake, which is 42, 43 homes, plus another 48. My math's off a few, but I'm sorry. Um, this will result in an increased emergency response time for the residents. Think about this for a minute. If you look at the entire proposed subdivision, the whole subdivision is outside of this two-mile threshold that's been talked about in these meetings every time you guys get together, okay? It's a great goal, Mayor. I think it's one that we should strive for, okay? But the entire subdivision is outside of that. I've driven it. My wife has driven it. If Look, I'm 60, 61 years old. If I'm living up in that subdivision, I'm, on, I'm in the last house, it would take EMS, it's about 2.3 miles, okay? All the way out through the maze of streets, uh, to, to the city services. You cut, a, you cut an access point at, at the other Epperson stub or even out on Old Humboldt Road, it, mark, it, it knocks it down to about 1.8 miles. Okay. That's a great goal that we should strive for. Um, it's also my understanding that this issue is a concern of this current county, uh, council, the current mayor's office, uh, as far as proper planning. Uh, Y'all have, in meetings just like this, in the last two or three months, it's been discussed, um, this very issue's been discussed in the Winchase subdivision and at, at Leisure Lane. It's been, it's been debated and, 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 and been presented to uh, citizens and, and residents of this city that in that area, they needed an extra access point just for safety. And now they're presenting that it, that's not an issue in North Point Lake, we'll be okay with one. It's a safety issue. How is this different than that? It's a 180. Think about that. Okay, that's what I'm asking you to do. Um, I've gone over my five minutes, but in closing, this is my opinion, okay? Developing any piece of land should make sense for everybody involved. The city of Jackson, its residents, Men and women who've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in a subdivision out there, we're proud of where we live. 
We keep up our yards. We keep up everything. We're proud when people come to see us. Okay? It should make sense for everybody involved, including the developer and including the landowner. Look, this lady had the forethought to buy this land 40 years ago, and she's getting ready to get paid, and she deserves to get paid. These guys that are going to develop this land or the next developers, they deserve to earn, earn a living as well. We're not against that, okay? But it needs to make sense for everybody involved. Uh, what options do developers have in a situation like this? Listen, there's no book that says that we've got to trudge on through with improper planning. They can walk away from it. They can go back to the landowner and say, listen, I don't know about the numbers, but we've offered $1.5 million. We just can't make, make the numbers work. Can you help us on the price? Because, listen, we've looked at this thing hard, and uh, we can't make it work. We've got, we've got some additional expenses. If she doesn't want to sell the land, she can plant some corn in the spring like she's done every year for the last 20 or 30 years. And they can move on to the next tract of land to develop properties that our city needs them to develop. Just because they can do it this way doesn't mean they have to do it this way. We would ask that, that your, uh, the city council approve this rezoning uh, request, but with some type of amendment or a contingency or something that says, listen, everything looks great except we need m multiple access points. And my question to you is, is this an option? Hopefully it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment being one we should speak in favor of or opposition to? Be recognized. Thank you. Yeah, you can. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's Kenny Sutherland. I'm one of the partners involved in this development of this track of property. Mayor Conger and all city council members, my name is Kenny Sutherland with KNL Partners. Myself and partner Lee Godfrey are local realtors that have been involved in new developments and construction of new homes for over 20 years. We appreciate your consideration today in the rezoning of this track of land from RS to RS1. For the past year, I've been in multiple meetings that included the chamber, Mayor Conger, Mayor Harris, Stan Pilot, realtors like myself, subdivision developers and many other local leaders and the sole purpose of those meetings were to focus on the desperate need of new housing due to our shortage of inventory in the Jackson area and how we can get more new homes online to help with the demand for housing that we are that we are facing. This tract of land is already within the sea limits and is already zoned residential. As Stan has previously mentioned, we are just trying to better utilize the property to its best potential and for future homeowner needs. Therefore, while we're asking for the RS1 rezoning. We have the support of the planning department and have be previously been approved for this RS zoning, RS1 zoning through the planning commission. With the new medical facility coming online, new businesses moving into Jackson, residents moving in from all parts of the country, this property will definitely help secure the housing for them. We're not trying or asking to do anything that hasn't been approved before in multiple subdivisions. This request for the RS1 rezoning us so that we can maximize the best use of the property for desperately need new housing. We appreciate your consideration in rezoning this tract of land from RS to RS1 and look forward to helping provide the housing that's needed in the Jackson area in the best timely manner. Um, I would like to try to answer or clarify a couple of things that was just previously mentioned. When we first looked at this piece of land, we had all intentions of trying to get a another access point to Old Humboldt Road. Um, Due to um, some sewer restrictions, um, then we also found out about the Blue Line Stream. The Blue Line, the Blue Line Stream is actually more crucial and critical than the JEA restrictions, um, because with this, you can only you have to stay off to the top bank of the of a of 60 feet of, as a buffer zone. Therefore, it just doesn't make sense to build 650 plus feet of street to go out to Old Humboldt Road then only have lots on one side of the street. It's just unfeasible. Um, but again, I think today we're here for rezoning and that's a planning uh, committee discussion. We'll get to that when we meet with them again. Um, but again, we're just trying to get the rezoning and the, as far as traffic, 
Um, it, it is true. Well, we're, we're only looking at about an additional 13 to 15 homes. So I don't think there's a big traffic issue with that number. Um, so. Mr. Sutherland, if I could clarify one thing, mm -hmm. 13 to 15 homes? Is the additional uh, over on? over what you had originally planned with the with, RS? With RS, correct, okay. yes, sir. Now, the blue line stream question, um, has there been a determination by uh, TDEC that there is, that is a blue line stream? Yes, sir, there has been. Okay. Um, and have you, have you challenged that? Have you gone to them? In my experience, there's opportunity to Kind of push uh, to have that classified as a wet weather conveyance. We have not. We've just been told it was blue line stream, so we took him for for what he what he said. Okay. Stan, do you, could you speak to the blue line stream issue? Do you have any information about that? Well, all I can tell you is TDEC determines, you know, when streams what they are, wet weather conveyances or blue line streams, and and we've asked them. Uh, or others have asked them in the past what what makes a blue line stream and it says well when we designate one a blue line stream so um, they have a criteria for for designating um, and you know there's there's also some tremendous grades associated with that with that stream because there's some uh, elevation changes between where the subdivision is and where you go into the creek because it's natural the channel is is lower than the existing ground so you've got some banks that are pretty steep if you look at the topo so it's it's topo and it's also the blue line stream <coughs> and and you've got the buffer zone that blue line streams would require but even if you had it not designated as a blue line stream you've got those banks that you can't develop into uh, without jeopardizing that you know that water conveyance because the grades that the steepness of that the banks that run down into it so there's some there's some challenges uh, associated with that, as well as the structure it would take to to cross it with a with a roadway, uh, you know that's that's not an inexpensive item either. So uh, we're talking about a box culvert, uh, you know, and those aren't cheap either. So so there are some things that uh, some that would be make it difficult. Um, would it make it impossible? Uh, you, you know, impossible is impossible, but y could you do it? Yes, you could do it, but again, to put the cost involved in getting across the blue line stream and satisfying all the buffering and to only get a few lots out of it just doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a, from a development standpoint. But again, um, we're just dealing with the rezoning right now. Um, the rezoning of is determining whether or not you could have 48 lots versus less than that um, the subdivision or the development of this property has been on the books since 2001 that's when the schematic was approved um, and at that time uh, it did show uh, other connections but at that time uh, since that time you know 20 years have passed and the regulations concerning TDEC and blue line streams and all that have changed over time so the connection to Epperson uh, is you, you can't really make that happen anymore because of the grades in that in that buffer zone and the old Humboldt Road you've got the crossing that you would have to do and then you'd only be able to get lots on one side so those two things make it to where uh, it, it, it's becomes less feasible to develop the subdivision um, now North Point Lake they came later, um, around 2010, uh, and at that time, North Point Lake was was zoned as a PRD. Now, it's an unusual PRD in that uh, when it was designed, the streets were made public. Uh, they chose to keep the streets public, uh, and at that time, there was a stub provided to the property to the east, uh, which is the property that's up for rezoning now, and. They provided that stub because there was a schematic <coughs> that was already planned that connected to that property to the to the west. So it was a connection point. And I know, you know, dealing with subdivisions over the years, connections are always uh, some problematic, uh, especially when you have subdivisions that have been there for some time without a connection. Uh, we had it with Shepherd's Field. 
Shepherd's <coughs> Field was designed to connect to Rooker Bend from the very beginning, but the connection didn't come till the very end, and that subdivision had some difficulties with that connection, even though it was <coughs> planned from the very beginning. Uh, was mentioned uh, Singing Tree uh, with Windchase. Uh, that connection was planned uh, way back, uh, and it's just that the, the subdivision developed and it got to the last section, and that's when the connection was made. Uh, that connection uh, was at the end. So again, people get accustomed to not having a connection. The time passes, and then when the connection does, there's always opposition to that. So we see that, and I can understand it from a, from a resident standpoint. You've got used to, to not mm -hmm. having that, that through traffic, but uh, uh, now you're gonna have some. But again, residential subdivisions, don't generate a whole lot of traffic. Uh, residential doesn't generate the traffic that commercial does or even multifamily or any other type of land use. Uh, they don't have peak times, uh, so you don't have, um, you know, everybody leaving at one time usually. Uh, it's staggered. Uh, but, you know, I in the end, you've, you're also planning a, a t this to be a private development and by nature, private developments because they'll own the streets aren't through, you know, don't have through traffic associated with them, and we, we've got many examples of that across the city of Jackson. So, there are some things that that you would take into consideration in looking at this schematic. But again, that schematic has not been submitted. Now, Kenny uh, showed them an example of a prototype of what they were going to do, but the zoning doesn't require that, and and that's not what's under review today, but. I know these issues come to play, so that's why I'm addressing them with you today. Uh, but you know, in terms of connecting, uh, if the if the you know if it was just about connecting, then the connection was going to happen regardless. Um, now, if it punched through to Old Humboldt Road, um, I know they've said that that would make it better for them, but I think that the chances w would be that you would get more traffic uh, coming through. Uh, if you pop all the way out to Old Humboldt Road, Let's because it was right there, stands. Yeah. Kenny, anything else? No. Okay, so thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. We're still under public comment, public hearing. So anyone still wishing to speak in favor of opposition to continue to be recognized at this time? So I saw. Yes, yeah, sir. You come up. And we'll get us off track of the conversation. State your name and your address, please, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Ricky Shankel. I live at 7 Rockwood here in Jackson. A uh, couple of three things. I'll try to be brief. I used to work construction uh, and build roads and things like that. I'm not an expert by any means, and they know a lot more about it than I do, but I have looked at that property up there, and there's, there is no way that that the road cannot be built. I'm not saying that houses can't be built, but it's it's a money it's a money thing that we're talking about. It's not that it can't. It's not that it can't. It's just it's not going to be if if they get their way. Another thing that has happened this year. <coughs> uh, this year, we was. Or my wife was went out to uh, do some errands, and on her way home, there was a, a car that caught on fire on Zachary, mm -hmm. and was blocked the road right there. There was no entrance to any of the subdivisions except from North Point side. If there hadn't been a North Point entrance to how many houses would have been at risk at that point? Probably 200 or more houses. And the, the lady talked about a four minute uh, response time while ago. That'd been out the wall. There'd been no, no way that could have happened. Uh, where we live there, there are seven children under 10 from where you turn at Rock Point to the uh, Epperson Stub that live right there. Also, an autistic boy that lives there. 
that has to back out into that Epperson uh, stuff to drive, and he's very capable of driving, but why, <laughs> you know, put somebody more at risk? But, but also across from, on, on that same point, uh, an ambulance has been to my neighbor's house three times this year. And two houses up, they have been there, I know, twice this year. It took them 30 minutes one time to come because they didn't have, for some reason, they didn't get there in time. But everything worked out. He's talking about the heart. That was the problem. You know, the heart, we're, we're wanting defibrillators and things like that. Well, if you can't get to somebody in time, then you've got a problem. I think the, the emergency response and the, the 2.1 2 mile just to get to the Epperson is, is a problem. Plus, you drive all the way through to the other end of it. I've been married 48 years. I know I don't look that old, but I, but I am. And uh, one thing that has kept us together is a thing called compromise. And that's all we're asking for today. We had not got a list of 12 things or 10, 15 things. We're asking for one thing, one thing only. And that's another access to this property. And we're not, I couldn't believe they said something about, you know, not wanting people to come through our area. What, we love people. I can tell you nearly everybody's name that's in that uh, subdivision now. I'm looking forward to the subdivision. I like people. I'm on the board. I, I meet people. I, I want to see people. I want our town to grow. And with this blue oval thing, it's going to grow. And that Baptist Hospital is sitting out there, that's a perfect place for them to, to come and, and live right there. I'm all about it. But I want it to be safe for everybody. I want that ambulance to be able to get through there. If that car that had been burned was sitting on Hanover, it would have it would have been no way to get back to us or to this Epperson. So anything can happen. A tree can fall in the road. I mean, I know that's all hypothetical, but anything can happen, and we don't want that to happen. So uh, I appreciate your uh, thoughts on this and uh, your consideration. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Saw another hand up. Yeah. Could put this map so we can yeah, see what you're talking about. Please. Sure. I'd like to see where the blue line is. Which is it? Maybe state your name, address. My name's Hal McIver. Um, I live at Nine South Point. I'm the president of the North Point Homeowners Association at this time, and um, just wanted to make a few uh, comments that I've heard from our homeowners in uh, North Point to address some of the things. Um, I think the number one thing is is going from RS to RS1. I don't know that everybody knows what that is, and I didn't until I looked into it. Um, <clears throat> I am a realtor, and um, so I still had to look it up. And uh, it basically says that the lot size is going to go from 15,000 square feet down to 9,000 square feet. So what that does is, I don't know if you're, you've noticed, but through North Point, most of those lots in there are about an acre. Uh, mine's an acre and a half just because it's kind of a pie-shaped lot, but most of those are about an acre in there. So when you look at the, we just got our new tax uh, reassessment thing, and my house went up $102,000, which I'm not here to cry about that. All I'm saying is, we have a substantial investment in those houses in North Point, and um, our homeowners in there take pride in our subdivision. We really care about each other, and we want what's best for the area. Um, if uh, houses come in and they're built, let's say, <coughs> at the um, RS1, um, that's going to be smaller lots. That's going to be less expensive 
to build, and I understand that. I'm, in, I'm a realtor. I've been doing this 17 years. I understand it's about the money. Um, however, there's other things to look at when you look at your home, if you were living there and you had a substantial investment in your, in your property, do you actually want a lot more small houses that are going to connect to your subdivision that could possibly bring down the value of your home? So um, that's just one thing. Another thing I, I noticed on the um, one of the proposed uh, things is if that is to be a gated subdivision and it's going to be gated from the Rockwood area over there on that end of Epperson, there is no turnaround for somebody that pulls up there and it's gated and they have to turn around and go back. Mm -hmm. So that's that's just one thing. And then the, the next thing, and I'll try to wrap it up, but uh, Zachary uh, is in need of repair. The road itself, there's a lot of sinkage. Um, there's obviously been a lot of construction back there. This is going to create more construction in our area. And if there's only one way in, then there's going to be uh, more sinkage on the streets uh, and, and just a rougher ride getting in there and, and just more wear and tear on our street. Um, I'm <clears throat> 69 years old and I have a few issues with my health and I've watched the ambulances come through there and it's not, they're not getting back there. If you start at my house, which is the entrance to North Point, uh, it takes about eight minutes to get back there to where they're talking about this cut through. So <clears throat> that eight minutes could be critical to somebody's life. Um, so um, just wanted to bring those things forward and uh, hopefully there could be some kind of compromise to get additional entrances uh, in here to make this work. So thank you. Thank you. See another hand back there? Come on up. Yep. Yeah, there we go. All can see your tops of heads, so it's hard for me to know who it is. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sandra Stepsinski, and I live at 40 Hanover Drive. Our house is exactly two houses off of Epperson Drive. We have lived in this house for five years, and I really think you all, the city needs to do a study on the traffic, the amount of traffic that comes down Hanover Drive off of Epperson. There is a stop sign there. Very few people stop for it. Uh, there are very few children on that. We are right in North Point. There are very few people on that street there, our children, I should say, um, and of course, they cannot play in the street. You really do need to do a study before you decide to do anything. There is a lot of traffic. With that proper property being built, it's only going to make matters worse. The, the, right in front of our house, the street is, is in disrepair. There are sinkholes. Um, every time a service truck goes over it, it wakes us up at 6.30 in the morning, where both my husband and I are retired. I, we moved into North Point because it was a quiet neighborhood. I personally um, don't want to stop progress. However, in our retirement, I certainly don't want to hear the pounding at 7 o'clock in the morning or earlier for the new construction because it's too hot to work at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Don't want to hear it on Sunday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning. It's our time to sleep in and have peace and quiet. <coughs> One of the neighbors, Kitty Corner from our house, just recently sold her home a little bit more than she asked for simply because the construction is going to happen behind where they lived. They cleared off the back end of their property so that they could enjoy the, wa the wilderness right there, seeing the deer, seeing the fox, seeing the turkeys. I don't think the neighborhood is going to change drastically, drastically. I don't think we deserve that. I believe in progress, but there's a lot of other land around this city. Why do you have to, to shove it all in one spot? I, I really and truly feel that you do need to do a study on the traffic on Hanover. 
it, you will be very surprised at how much traffic there is. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, sir. My name is Tim Harris. I live at 88 Rock Point in North Point Lake. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, and, and, and we're really not just talking about rezoning today. We, the, the issue with the access points is, is by far the most important issue to us. Um, and I am also one of the homeowners that when I, when I was looking to build or buy in North Point Lake, I was told by my real estate agent, Kenny, uh, who I've known for quite a while, uh, I have n you know no issues with Kenny whatsoever, but I was promised at that time, and I say promised, that uh, the Epperson, the two Epperson stubs would be linked. When that property is developed, there would be a drive that connects both those Epperson links, so there would not be just one access coming from that subdivision. Uh, also, if you uh, right here, uh, there's a farm road that goes up into this mm -hmm. property. And I have driven myself, walked myself. Um, there's, Stan, I, I may have misunderstood you, but did you say something about a, you have to cross that blue line ditch to get to that property? You do have to deal with that ditch, yes. Well, it's, you really don't have to cross it. I mean, I've, I've driven up in there in my truck and, and walked it, and it's, it's, I didn't measure it, but it is, it is very wide. So, um, okay. uh, can you all show us where the blue line ditch is versus where the farmer's land? It's in this area. And then where's the farmer's But land? there's there's also a little bit of extra that kind of comes off of it, but most of it's in that in the area where you see right here where the trees are. Did you say something? What, what's the, the question about the farm? The farmer's, where is the pull out that the farmer uses and is able to drive from Old Humboldt? It is Indiana. right here. It's, okay. it, it, it's just right on that line and then it comes into the field right here. Then you can come okay. that way. When so you drive up in the field, I mean, you're looking at the back of Miss Lucy's house. It's real, it's real close there. And uh, another point, there's the person that's building a house right now is, has put in a circle drive and his, 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 the north part of his circle drive is right on that blue line ditch. I mean, it's as close to me to the mayor, or actually closer to that blue line ditch. There's much, much, much more room on the north point where I drive in, where I can drive into that property that to put a road. Now, I'm not a road builder. Stan knows much more about that than I do, but uh, I've, I've, I've walked it, I've driven on it, I've turned around my truck without even getting in the property. I've actually turned my truck around on that road, that's how wide it is, without getting off of it. So, um, but another point that I came up here to make specifically is, could you go back to that? <coughs> okay, well, there is a sinkhole, it's actually on the, you can't see it, but there is a sinkhole right now at the, at the intersection of Epperson and North Point. And, and it's my understanding that on Hanover, there's Epperson and North Point right there to the, behind the mayor's head, but um, <laughs> not, <laughs> not suggesting that you move, but um, if that sinkhole, and, and, and to my understanding, there's already been a couple of sinkholes on Hanover Drive in the past few years. Um, if that sinkhole that's occurring right now at Epperson and North Point would happen up here on Hanover, like, what would that be, west of Zachary, after this subdivision goes in, and say it takes, I don't know, three days, two weeks for the city to fix it, you would have a hundred homes, a hundred families that are landlocked and cannot get in and out of their home. I mean, you have to take that in consideration when you're talking about rezoning. This is not just rezoning to us.
Any questions? I mean, does that, am I making that point? I think you make, make Mr. Harris, you made your point. All right. Appreciate it. Uh, any questions? And, uh, well, I just thought of one more thing. If, if this goes through, <coughs> can we not even just come up with a construction access? I mean, you look at the 90 degree turns right there. You got one on Hanover. You got another one on Rockwood. You got another one going north on Rockwood, and you got another one going on Epperson into, you've got, what's that, four 90 degree turns and you're bringing low boys in and bulldozers and concrete trucks. How are you gonna do that? Mm -hmm. Well, question for the engineer. Thank you, right, appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you. One more hand back there. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. I'm Mitchell Bonicelli. Uh, my wife and I own 41 Sharon Lane, which is actually right here. This property that borders out into the field right here. Uh, Miss Lucy and I, we know each other because we had a little friendly conversation about, you know, hey, how far do you own land of that or whatnot? Well, my thing about it is all this that they're talking about building into, it's super wet. It's super wet. There's, it's not, nothing's ever going to hold. You're talking about sinkholes, all that stuff. But what happens, like, I had to put a fence up right here, all right? All those houses, all that construction, everything that's going on right there, that's going to be right in my property. I don't mind development. It's her land. She can do with it what she wants to do. At the same time, you're building the drive going all the way through here. It's, it's going to be causing so much noise, so much chaos that all the residents of North Point, you know, even me getting out there because I'm in the county, I've had people flag me down like, hey, do you mind keeping it down back there? Yeah, I don't mind. I got to cut the field twice a year, so, you know, tractor's going to go back there. But most of them that border right through here have been super nice, super friendly. I even let one of them, you know, use some of my property to kind of help out with his backyard. But all of this right here is super tight. It, is, it's, it looks big. It sounds big. It's not big. Eighteen and a half acres is nothing. They're going to be packed in there like sardines. It is going to be tight, overcrowded, and it's just going to be a mess. This road that accesses right here is super small. And plus, Old Humboldt, how much traffic is already on Old Humboldt? We have two schools down there, the Star Center, only one little cutoff going back to 45 off of Ashport. Ashport going back towards the other entrance of North Point is super small. I can't hardly get through there. If I'm going home, I can't get through there when the school hours are. I'm sitting there in traffic for 45 minutes just trying to get to my house. Ambulances, fire trucks, all that stuff come through there. What are they going to do? Move the cars off into a ditch? You can't. You can't do that. You're adding 40 to 50 more homes back there. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Unless you make Old Humboldt or Ashport or something bigger and the city wants to spend the money to do that, I just don't see the what how that's going to benefit anybody at all. That's really all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right here, then we'll go to you, Miss. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, wait, wait, wait till you get to the microphone. Oh, we can get you on record. I said, good morning. I'm Lee Godfrey. I'm Kenny's partner. I, I would like, if Stan has this other map, I just want to address the two or three issues. I'll be very brief, but uh, that, that have been brought up in this meeting. This 60-foot this buffer right here, according to TDEC, uh, we have other developments that front on this 60-foot buffer, and you cannot touch that land. We have to put a silt fence up along that green line, and you can't, you can't touch the land or use the land for any reason. As Stan pointed out, there's a lot of elevation change. If you can see these lines, how it slopes down to this ditch. And if a road were to be built, if it connected here and went out to Old Humboldt, that's 652 feet of road, and we would only be able to get lots on one side of the road. It's economically unfeasible to build a subdivision and only be able to get lots on one side of a road. So that is an economic situation, but the other situation 
Uh, if you notice this blue line stream coming down to Epperson, to uh, Lucy Troutman's driveway, this can't be built now because of TDEC regulations. When this plat was approved, and it was in 01, I agree, but as Stan pointed out, when this preliminary plat was approved back in 2001, there was no TDEC. There were no regulations, no mandate for any soil erosion control or anything like that. And everything's changed now, and we do have to abide by TDEC regulations. So I, I just wanted to point that out to everyone concerned, the council and the mayor, so that we're all on the same page. Uh, that there is a drive here, and there is a drive, and you can drive up, up to, through a, a field road to this tract of land presently. That, that's very true. But if it is developed, there will be a street, there would be a street 652 feet that will be built with only lots on one side. It's, it's not economically feasible for any developer to build a public road and have lots on one side of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Um, Mr. Over. Godfrey, Mr. Yes, Chairman, before he leaves, I thought this was going to be a private. Wouldn't that mm -hmm. road be private if the subdivision is going to be private? Come on, uh, the the road out to Ohumbo? Yes, sir. If that were built, oh, uh, we probably would not make the subdivision private. Okay, thank you, M uh, Mr. Godfrey. Real quick, yes, where, sir. where does the stream, when it gets to North Point, where does it go? Does it go in a in a pipe somewhere? Uh, it, you know, it goes under the road, goes under Old Humboldt Road. The water flows in this direction. Okay. The, and it goes under Old Humboldt Road. And, so th and this is the start of the stream. Where does the, it start? This this is the start of the stream. I, I don't know. I don't know. I have I haven't checked into that, Mr. Taylor. I do not know. Okay. Thank you. Um, but again, uh, that's the main issue: is the elevation of the land and this 60-foot buffer and the fact there's no way to build lots but on one side of the road. That, that's the reason that we don't feel like we can take the road out to Old Humboldt. We're not trying to hurt anyone, and we honestly feel like, Stan, that if there is an entrance to Old Humboldt, it will increase the traffic through North Point Lake, not decrease it. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Godfrey. Thank you. Okay. You know, I've got the question. And we got him next right here, so. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Cesar Cerdeta. I just moved in. <coughs> right there on the home, um, right here in the corner on Epperson. Address? What's your address, sir? Uh, Seventy-two. Okay. Seventy-two Epperson. So um, lots of traffic there. Um, the traffic does impact my life quite a bit. I have a son with special needs, and it's a blessing to be able to take him on bike rides through Hanover and uh, Zachary Lane and all that. Um, so having a s child with special needs, you got to be careful, got to be on your watch, and the increased traffic uh, would impact my life. So if they, you guys can think of any alternatives to, you know, the points presented, um, I'll be grateful. That's it. Yes, sir. Tim Harris again. I'll just take just a second. Um, can we put that other map back up again? To address that ditch for another second, um, it it's underground until it gets on out here a little bit. There is a six foot culvert, walk through culvert, right in here somewhere. And don't count, don't. I mean, I'm not trying to be exact, but this. The Epperson stub there could go on into that property, the Epperson Drive. Um, I'd be afraid to guess how far down that is, but all this water comes underground until it gets on into Miss Lucy's property, and then, it, and then the Blue Line ditch opens up and goes under Old Humboldt. Um, so, it's, it's drawn on the map to where it comes all the way up to Epperson, but that is not accurate. Uh, also, um, Kenny said something a while ago about it's like it's almost commonplace in Jackson to have 100 homes with only one access. I've been back there thinking ever since then, where actually is another place like that? So 
100 homes with one access and sinkholes in the street. My point's made. Thank you. I appreciate Thank you, Mr. Harris. All right, anyone else wishing to speak in favor of or opposition to? Be recognized at this time. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Any additional discussions or questions from council? Mayor, could I get a, a fire chief to come up for a second? Chief Samuels? Yeah. Pop quiz time, sir. Yep. <laughs> Can you uh, address the emergency issues as far as time in, in that subdivision if they add an addition to it? Well, it wouldn't add any more time. We have a fire station on Ashport and we also have one on Windy City Road. Our response time would be under uh, four minutes. So response time of EMS? It would not add to our response time. Usually when we go on an EMS call, we are there before EMS, and we do our preliminary uh, findings, and EMS will come and transport to the hospital. On occasion, they will beat us, but it would not add any time to our response. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I serve on the planning committee, and I was at that meeting and I did vote no, and the reason I voted no is I've driven out there several times, and it, just from looking at it, it does not appear to make sense to add this many additional homes without another entrance. If I was wanting to buy a home, I would think it would be advantageous to go directly in from Old Humboldt, but that's just an opinion. But when we voted, we were told about the blue line stream and that also that JEA could not accommodate them. So that's where I'm having an issue. Is there anyone here that could, can we understand JEA's point or? Yeah, we got a representative from JEA. My name is Kurt Gormit. I am the project engineer for Waterways Water Division at Jackson Energy Authority. And there are um, a couple options here that we discussed uh, with Mr. Kenny and Mr. Lee. Um, been, it, as they spoke, we originally had proposed a gravity sewer from what our Moise Creek interceptor is to the east of this property. Um, there were some, I think, some discussions and some needed easement, some blue line stream. So that was kind of off the table, um, I believe, at, at this time. But there is also another option, which we call our low pressure system or a force main, that we can serve this property. So we do have sewer there on Everson Drive and um, uh, or on both Everson Drive that we could tie into with a force main. Now the, the homes would have to have a low pressure system, which is called, we go with an E1 and, uh, grinder pump, um, but it is a viable sewer solution uh, and that is an option for the development. So um, as far as we're concerned, as far as serving the um, subdivision with water, wastewater, uh, there's no hardship on our end. There, there are options there. All right, thank you, Mr. Arment. In your opinion, with oh, this- Oh, Mr. Arment, hold on. Oh. She, she waited till you got up before she asked a question. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I come to the In your opinion, then, would this be feasible? Or do you have an opinion from coming in from Old Humboldt Road addressing the blue line strength? As far as the opinion, no, ma'am, I do not. Um, on behalf of JEA, you know, we want to work with all and any developments as far as serving them with water and wastewater. But being in the city limits, we, you know, we do plan to serve this development. So um, there are options there. Obviously, gravity sewer would be the, 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 the best option, but E1 is, is a viable solution. A force main is, is a very viable solution. So um, we would say 1A, 1B as far as that goes. So I think this development, um, with or without, um, as shown, but we, we plan to work with the development and we can serve the development with wastewater, whether it be gravity or, or low pressure system. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions for Mr. Arm before he gets up? No, all right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any additional questions from council, comments from council? All right, is there a motion? 
I'd like to make the motion that we approve the zoning as it is with a second entrance. So contingent upon a second entrance? Yes. I'd second that. All right. There's a motion for a approval of the rezoning contingent upon a second entrance. Have a question. Question for Councilman Senator Skinner? Yes. Uh, the second entrance, I thought that there won't be able to make a second entrance due to the buffers. Am I correct? It, Is it, that still on it, the table? It would be difficult. Now, would it be impossible? No. But it, would it be difficult? Yes. Now, again, we're sort of mixing zoning and subdivision things together. And I know from the people's standpoint, um, the subdivision connectivity uh, is, a, is something to, to be concerned about. Um, but I also understand that um, by practice, the Planning Commission is responsible for the subdivision layouts, design, because it's the technical aspects of those subdivisions that the Planning Commission reviews. They're, it really, they're looking at lighting patterns, they're looking at uh, the things that make up a subdivision and not necessarily the things that uh, zoning looks at. And so what you're, what you're doing is sort of lumping com subdivision issues in with the rezoning and, and, and it gets into conditional zoning where you're saying, I'll give it to you, uh, but only. Uh, and that is sort of binding the Planning Commission because now you're saying to the Planning Commission, You've, you must approve a design that has two connecting points. Now, I don't, I have never seen that happen before. Uh, there are some, some legal issues that tend to stick in my mind about those things because the process for subdivisions is solely within the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission. The rezoning process is solely within the, the jurisdiction of the City Council. So, so again, the zoning deals with whether you can have lots of a certain size. Now, Lewis, you want to come up for a pop quiz? Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> <That's laughs> but Mayor, why, why he why he's coming up and it, as, as Stan has mentioned, that, that's why I have a problem with with what we're doing. I think we are mixing uh, a, a city council vote on rezoning uh, and uh, subdivision issues relative to the Planning Commission, I guess my quick question is, will those issues be able to be addressed in a, a, a another forum and, and not necessarily today uh, relative my, to rezoning? Here's my pop quiz prediction, that if it is conditional zoning, and it sounds like it, that if you rezoned it with that condition, and if that condition was appealed that the condition would be stricken from the rezoning and the rezoning would, would occur anyway. That's my prediction. That's based on nothing but uh, the distaste the courts have for conditional zoning in most circumstances. But if you want uh, a, a research reason to answer, I need more time than what I've been given. That's, uh, but that's what I think would happen. Would it be appropriate for me to withdraw my motion and table this item until we can have yours, more yours research? Is a second, so it was we Council, it's good. Councilman Wallace's motion. Mm -hmm. So we, we well, let well. me make one comment Let's before she withdraw it. I do okay. that. Um, again, I serve on the planning committee, and I just feel like that we didn't have. And you do a fantastic job, Mr. Pollock. You know I, I think that, but I feel like we didn't have a clear picture of this. That the blue line stream was not explained adequately. Um, and after driving out there, again, I do have a hard time with seeing that there's a road that goes into it. Well, let, me just, the, let me just state that, that again, the, the Planning Commission really didn't get into a, a, a in-depth discussion of the subdivision development because it was not so submitted to them to review. So the blue line stream, the things you're talking about, the points of access, all that are components of the review of the schematic when the schematic comes before the Planning Commission. That's the reason why 
we didn't get into a lot of that because they weren't asking uh, for us to review a schematic. Kenny Sutherland submitted a proposal to the people that lived in North Point Lake, but it was just a proposal. It was not an approved schematic that was submitted to the Planning Commission. Now, can the Planning Commission look at the points of access when the schematic comes through? Yes. Can the, can the Planning Commission look at the Blue Line stream? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can the Planning Commission look at whether this development schematic makes sense or not? Yes. But those are all discussions and all reviews that happen within the Planning Commission and they haven't gotten to that point yet. What the zoning does is allow them to go down to a smaller lot. Now all the lots in that s proposed schematic, because again, it's not approved, a lot of them are greater than 9,000 square feet. There are only s some that are smaller. And North Point Lake is a PRD, and their lots are smaller than what's in North Point. It, they, they roughly range in the 12,000 range. So, so uh, a, a number of these lots in what's proposed are in that same range. It's just some of them are, are smaller than that. Uh, but without the RS1, you can't even get down to the lot size that's in North Point Lake because the RS requires a, a 15,000 square foot lot. So again, um, that's what the zoning is about, is whether or not they can have the flexibility to go below 15,000. The other issues that we're talking about today that, that all the people have brought up are all subdivision issues, the drainage, the blue line, the, whether the pipe ends at the street at Everson or on up the road, I, you know, all those things have not been fleshed out because that review has not occurred. So what I would say is look at the appropriateness of the lot sizes that are proposed that could happen in this subdivision and let the Planning Commission determine the schematic and the subdivision and how it develops and, and, and the way it develops. That's, that's how the processes are designed it's to, the Planning Commission is by nature to be outside the political realm mm -hmm. and to be in the technical review realm, to look at all these things that we're talking about. So I would ask you to leave that to the Planning Commission to do, which you are a part of. You will see that review and that will come through your, the, the Planning Commission. And whatever they approve as a schematic will be how that property uh, gets developed, if it develops. Uh, but again, I don't think you should mix the two processes together because they're distinct and they're different. Uh, if you don't like the lot sizes being smaller than 15, uh, then don't approve the zoning. If you don't have a problem with the lot sizes being smaller and comparable to what's in North Point Lake, then approve the zoning and let the Planning Commission work out the schematic and the subdivision issues. Mr. Chairman. So, I'm Mr. Chair, one thing I'd like to say in regard to the, the motion presented, um, I'm not privy to this experience and this information in regard to the additional access, the blue line and whatnot. Uh, so to add that in, I don't feel as if I have any relevant experience to really to, to vote on such a thing. Um, and, you know, it's council members Wallace and, and Taylor, they obviously have some experience there, so I get it. But for the rest of us, I'm not sure if we are well qualified to step beyond the traditional zoning to add in this conditional zoning. So we also, we have uh, the opportunity to set a dangerous precedent. Uh, dangerous may be, to be a bit dramatic, but to set a precedent where anytime there's some sort of quabble over planning or, or um, subdivision, uh, you know, we, I just don't feel as if we're qualified to make the additional decisions. That's why we have Stan, our planning committee, uh, so that we can keep it simple, focus on the zoning and not add in this conditional stuff that it's a language we don't speak, some of us, I would say. Saying, based on what you're saying, the issue they're talking about can still be addressed. It right. could be, yes. I mean, it will be. It will be. Uh, it will be. When, the, when the Planning Commission reviews the schematic, all these issues of points of access will be reviewed. Uh, and the things associated to talk about today, the 60-foot buffer, the TDEC requirements, all those things will be a part of the review that the Planning Commission will do. And so, just by approving the zoning, you don't eliminate that discussion. That discussion has not happened yet mm -hmm. because they have not submitted a schematic and they can't submit a schematic because their schematic is based on a zoning change. So if you don't go the zoning through the zoning process, 
then this schematic can't even be discussed. So again, I think, you know, as your as your planning staff, I would say let the planning commission do what they do, and you do what you do. Yeah. Stand very quickly. Yeah. So all of these fine citizens who spoke uh, uh, against the rezoning, in in, in a sense, and and uh, uh, presented their issues relative to interest, ingress, egress, all of those other issues that they are uh, here to address today. They'll have another opportunity to meet with the planning department and Councilman, uh, Councilwoman uh, Wallace and uh, uh, when that issue have all comes, of those issues fully addressed. When that Is issue that comes, yes, sir. And that's just down the road. Uh, it, it just depends. All right, we have a motion and a second on the table currently. Motion. What's the doing? motion? Yeah. Motion is the conditional zoning motion. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd be in favor if the councilwoman is uh, uh, amiable uh, to rescind the motion and motion to table this until we have information on the blue line stream and the capacity of this property to, if if uh, the planning commission could work it out to accommodate two entrances. I think the the questions that are in my mind are, where does the blue line stream daylight from the pipe? Uh, and what is the what are the grades in and around that? I know we're we're solely tasked with um, deciding the zoning, but we're also deciding the capacity of this neighborhood with the zoning request. Uh, and so, along with that comes traffic and density issues that we need to be aware of. Mr. Chairman, I'm in favor of that. Yeah, yeah I need. Can you clarify what we're doing yeah. there? Yeah, please clarify what you're what you, what you Mr. Chairman, I would like to rescind my motion and make the motion that we table this until we get further information what would actually impact the zoning from uh, currently. All right, the motion is to table it. Yeah. Even if we table it, it's still going to be right back at square one. I mean, yeah. still got to go through the process. Is that correct? You still, I sure. mean, again, the Planning Commission is still charged with reviewing the schematic and sure. all these things about blue line and where the pipe comes out and, and all that's to the, for the Planning Commission to review, not the City Council. Well, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to contest you a little bit. Well, we, have a, we have a motion on the table. We have a second before we start discussion. We have a second on the motion to table yet? Se second. Okay, now discussion. So we delegate those powers to the Planning Commission. The City Council does that. That they establish the planning commission to deal with these technical issues to educate themselves annually. Is that incorrect? No, so when we establish the planning commission, we that was established. I, I think the planning commission is established pursuant to state statute. Uh, and it's, it's inside the city and the region of the city. Is what so, I think. but my city my council. my point remains that the the issue that we're deciding is the density of this neighborhood. Today, that's what we're deciding. The zoning request is based on density. Minimum lot size, right? Right, which drives the density of the neighborhood, the number of homes that are in the neighborhood. I, again, uh, that's what the zoning is about, what kind of lot sizes they can have, yeah. what the minimum lot size is. And so my, my, my point remains that as we decide that, we need to know if there are the, uh, is there, there's an opportunity for multiple points of ingress and egress. Well, I mean, again, your subdivision regulations, which you also, uh, the Planning Commission has approved, do not require that subdivisions that are less than 50 lots r have two points of access. You can say that you, you know, that that's an issue for you, but the subdivision regulations that govern how a subdivision develops says if it's not over 50 lots, you don't have to have a point of access. Mr. Taylor, <coughs> I, I think what you're asking, or maybe not, but does the council have a second level of review mm -hmm. over the schematics? I don't think they do. No, we. I know we don't. Okay. I know this is the last time that we would see this. I understand that. Okay. My, my question is, if, if we were to approve this today, we're basically saying there is not going to be a second, there's no potential for a second entrance. That's right. You're saying that that decision will be made at another time by another body. Well, b but we're rezoning portions of this that do not have access, that do not come to Old Humboldt Road. 
and they don't have to mm -hmm. based on the sub regs. I understand that, but but if if the if the planning commission in the future said, hey, we do want a second entrance, how are you going to do it? And that, then we have to go through another rezoning process for the frontage that abuts Old Humboldt, or they have to meet the RS. Yeah, we wouldn't uh, see it. Yeah. They have to meet the RS zoning requirement. Well, again, those are ifs. Um, but again, that's left to the Planning Commission. And what the Planning Commission determines, whether they determine there's two points of access, one point of access, whatever happens after that will be whatever needs to happen to make the development work. It may be the developers walk away and say, we can't make it work. Okay. And, and again, those are, though again, I, I just want to point out, those are issues for the Planning Commission. I understand. And, and, I and they really, if we start conditionally zoning, uh, the, the, the conditional zoning is withdrawn. Well, if we start making zoning decisions based on subdivision issues, if you said we're not going to zone this because of a lack of two points of access, but the sub regs say that you don't have to have those two points of access, see how they would be in conflict with each other? Well, I, I don't think that we were, we've withdrawn that. So no, now I'm we're talking about even at, if you based your decision. If there's the capacity for it. Well, there's a capacity because there's public streets. I mean, these, these streets were designed for connectivity and public streets. So, so they, their capacity is there. The sub regs determine what the capacity of the street is. You've heard public safety say there's no problem with response time. So really, it's just a question of do we want 48 lots or do we want 30-something lots? The density is going to be the density based on the zone. So we've got a, a call for questions. Right, we have a motion and a second on tabling this um, consideration of rezoning the property. Council, please vote. Motion fails. Motion fails. One, two, three, four, five, the two. Mayor. Yes. I'd, I'd like to make a motion for rezoning. All right. There's a motion to approve the, re the rezoning in a second. Any further discussion on the motion in the second? Council, please vote. Motion passed seven to seven to zero. All right. No. Item two. Consideration of an ordinance to rezone property located at 57. Mayor, I think the vote was five. Five two. Five, five, two. two. Okay. five, two. five two. Okay. Right. Consideration of an ordinance to rezone property located at 57 Bolivar Highway from OC Office Center District to B5 Highway Business District comprising of 0.37 acres more or less. Mayor and Council, you have the materials pertinent to this rezone request. The petitioner is asking to rezone uh, his property that's currently divided uh, by zoning, part of it's zoned OC and part of it's zone B5. So he's just wanting to consolidate his zoning under one zoning scheme of B5. All right, any questions from council? Move to approve. Second. Right. Well, this is an item on first reading, so we will open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of or opposition to can be recognized at this time. No one here for that one. All right, uh, close the public hearing. We have a motion and a second on the floor, on the table. Any further discussion? Council, please vote. Motion passed seven to zero. All right. Thank item, you, Mayor and Council. Thank you, thank Stan. You. Item three is proposed budget amendment to the general fund for downtown development director position, the amount of $60,000. The uh, Jackson Downtown Development Corporation and uh, Cole are working together in a more uh, collaborative model now in terms of sharing expertise sharing resources to kind of continue and advance the development downtown. Uh, this request comes at $60,000 a year for five years to fund a director position. Uh, it would come from fund balance. So. As Ben Ferris and Lisa Garner, you all can come up and address the council and give them the plan. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We appreciate y'all having here, us here this morning. We've got a subdivision we'd like to talk through. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
I'm not begging you. Uh, no, we really do appreciate this. Uh, this is the culmination of several months of conversations, both with the mayor's office, with the chamber, uh, with the board of the Downtown Development uh, Corporation, uh, and just figuring out a way where we can uh, hopefully reboot that organization and, and have it um, operating at the same level of momentum that downtown currently is. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, new investors, a lot of, uh, I think everybody here sees what's going on downtown. Uh, we want to make sure that we've got the resources there for the entrepreneurs that are locating here, for the businesses and filling the gaps that downtown may feel that they need, and the, and the constituents that live in downtown, making sure that we're recruiting the, the businesses and the solutions that they need in this area uh, to continue to develop this, this downtown community. And so uh, Lisa, who, who runs the Co, we've got experience. Uh, we've, we're now in uh, uh, almost uh, a decade's worth of entrepreneur development in this community and through, across the state. Uh, we've done a lot of placemaking uh, throughout the state as well, and so helping to build out uh, several different um, assets in, in different communities uh, across the state. Uh, and then lastly is, is we've just got infrastructure in place so that whoever comes into that, that director role will have a team to work with when it comes to marketing, when it comes to events, when it comes to uh, working with the, uh, the developers and the, and the folks that make up downtown uh, to find solutions that work for them. And I think historically, this organization, you've had a person kind of sitting out on an island, and I think that's, that's a lot to ask of one person. I think there was recently a meeting held by the mayor's office about downtown needs, and there are a lot. They're varied, and I think what everybody wants from downtown, uh, there's a lot of voice in that conversation, and so we want to have the tools, the resources, and the people available to help pull that together and bring before this, this community the solutions that are needed and help do that in a way that's collaborative and inclusive and, and hopefully that we can all be proud of as we develop downtown and take advantage of all the seeds that have been sown over so many years. All right. Thank you, Ben. Any questions for, I'm sorry, y'all didn't introduce yourselves for the record, please. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Ben Ferguson. I'm CEO of the Co. Uh, live at uh, 283 High Point Road. Lisa Garner, Executive Director at the Co. 579 Westmoreland Place. All right. Any questions for Ben or Lisa? All right, this is an item on first reading, so I'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak in favor of or opposition to can be recognized at this time. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. And is there a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion from council? Uh, just for the record, I've, uh, I've been working alongside this group to try to bring this to fruition. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. I appreciate your work on that, too. Thank you. All right, council, please vote. Motion passed six to zero. All right, get on to second reading. Item one is consideration of an ordinance to rezone property located at 2949 Highway 45 bypass from OC Office Center District to SC1 Plan Commercial District comprising of 6.7 acres more or less. This item was passed on first reading. So I move. Have a motion. Second. second. And a second. Any discussion from council? Council, please vote. Motion passed five to zero. Item two is consideration of an ordinance to rezone property located at Ashport Road, Shallow Spring Subdivision from RS Single Family Residential District to RS2 Single Family Residential District comprising of 26.61 acres more or less. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Council, please vote. Motion passed five to zero. Item three is consideration of an ordinance to close Jefferson Alley located between South Royal Street, Dr. Martin Luther King Drive, Jr. and Short Street. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Council, please vote. Motion passed five to zero. Item four is consideration of an ordinance to close an alley located between 118 McCowan Street, 317 North Island Avenue, and close the remaining portion of White Street North located between 117 West Dedrick Street and 309 North Highland Avenue. So moved. Have a motion. Second. And a second. Any further discussion? Council, please vote. Motion passed six to zero. All right, move on to new business. Item one is election of a vice mayor. I'll recognize our current vice mayor, Councilman Taylor. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you all for um, your support over the last year. Um, we've, I, I've really enjoyed reading the, uh, the agenda to you guys at our meetings. I'm hopeful uh, <laughs> at the next, uh, as we review the charter um, in the coming months and year, uh, that 
we establish some more clarity on a couple of positions, the vice mayor position being one, the treasurer position being another. Uh, but I, I would like to nominate uh, Ms. Marta Wallace uh, for the vice mayor position for this coming year. Second. All right, we have a motion to second for Councilmember Wallace to be elected vice mayor. Any further discussion? Any other nominations? Any other nominations? All right, council, please vote. Motion passed six to zero. All right, congratulations, Vice Mayor Wallace. Thank you. Item two is consideration of the salary and compensation study and presentation. Morning, Steve. Morning. I guess it's still morning. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Steve Thompson with Burris Thompson Associates. Uh, we were the uh, firm selected to conduct the compensation study for the city of Jackson. Uh, I'd like to take some time to just review the methodology, what we did to uh, con conduct the study and uh, our findings and our recommendations. Um, just as a, as a point of reference, uh, we do consider this still to be a little bit of a work in progress. We're probably 80 to 90 percent of the way done, but uh, as is always the case when we do compensation studies, uh, people come and go and jobs change up to the last minute. So there's always some some minor changes, but uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape as far as getting where we need to be. So um, probably the best way to do this would be if you have questions as they go along, uh, feel free to jump in. I have a tendency to talk too fast, so I'll try to go as slow as I can. And uh, our experience has been that sometimes, you know, sometimes we have to come back another day to re explain it again. So I, to avoid that, I'm, I'm trying to be as methodical as I can and afford you the opportunity to ask any questions as we go, just to make sure we all understand what we did and, and the results. Um, as I understand it, you all have in, a packet that contains um, some materials. We'll kind of refer to those as we go here. I'm going to kind of go from a PowerPoint here to hit the highlights. And then again, as, as if you have any questions along the way, feel free to jump in. And we'll, we'll also have some room for uh, time for questions and answers at the end. So we'll talk about the process, the findings, recommendations, results, uh, some cost information as far as implementation, and then questions and answers at the end. So basically, there we took followed these five steps as far as con conducting a study. Uh, first is job analysis, uh, making sure we understand the jobs. Secondly is compiling the market data, uh, developing a pay structure, determining pay adjustments, and then uh, we haven't done this quite yet, but helping the city update the pay policy. So just to kind of put some flesh on this a little bit, the job analysis is to make sure we understand the jobs. So the approach we took, we always take, is, is a market-driven approach. So jobs are valued like they're valued in the marketplace. So we do not make some sort of subjective evaluation of job knowledge requirements or education or experience or problem solving or mental effort or physical requirements. That's not what we do. We've, I've done those in the past. Uh, our approach is strictly how are the jobs valued in the marketplace? That's how we're going to value them. Um, seems to be the trend in, in the private sector as well as the public sector to go that way as opposed to some sort of job content evaluation, although there are consultants out there that do those plans as well. Um, so to, to, to accomplish a market-driven approach, we, may, we, we need to make sure we understand the jobs very well so that we can compare apples and apples as best we can uh, when, we come, when we look at the data from, from our, our data sources. So uh, we're going to compile, compile market data from two sources, and I'll show these in a minute here. Um, we'll have a public sector database and a private sector database. Uh, we'll use that information. Step three is, is developing a pay structure. Uh, when I'm talking about a system of pay grades and steps. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And then determining employee adjustments. Uh, once we have jobs valued, we've developed a pay structure. We've assigned jobs to pay grades. Each pay grade has a, a set of pay steps. Then we have to determine how do we adjust employee compensation to fit into that new pay plan. Um, 
It's not that we're going to take everybody to the market rate for the job. Some people, some employees might, after the adjustments, be at the market rate. Some might be above. Some still might feel but below the market rate represents some of your five to seven years of experience. So and I'll explain that a little bit more here as we go. And then lastly, update the pay policy. Okay, so job analysis. Um, basically, uh, the key, key pieces here where we reviewed all the city's job descriptions um, and uh, Lynn, Lynn Henning, HR director and the department heads were working feverishly <laughs> as we, before and during this process to make sure the job descriptions were up to date as best as possible. Um, and they, by and large, they were in pretty good shape. There were some departments that were a little bit, a uh, little bit uh, outdated. But um, that's the last thing, the last point up here. The department head meetings. They met individually with each department head, and reviewed the jobs, the organization of the department, and the jobs in the department. We discussed at some length what the job, each job required in terms of qualifications, experience. Talked about how jobs, uh, the, the workflow within the department and uh, who reports to who. So by the time we were done with that meeting, I had a pretty good top level understanding of, of all the jobs. Combine that with the job descriptions, I felt pretty comfortable that we could make our market data comparisons. Okay. Um, compiling the market data. So we had two, two sources of data. First is our public sector benchmarks. Um, we selected these, ran these by the mayor as uh, fairly good comparable cities and counties for the city of Jackson. One of the challenges Jackson has in terms of uh, compiling comparative market data is you're kind of out here, I don't know if I say an island, but you're, you're kind of out here by yourselves. It's not like I, I come from middle Tennessee where you know we have 30 municipalities all within three county area, um, big, large, small. Uh, out here, you, you're kind of, in terms of the size, the 50,000 plus, you're, you're kind of it until you get to, to Germantown, Bartlett, Collierville, and, and uh, going, going east to, to Davidson, Williamson County. So, um, so some of these cities are a little bit further out. We were, they were selected in terms of uh, being comparable demographics as well as operational philosophy. We don't have the high payers on here necessarily. Um, the Rentwoods, the Franklins, but we do have you know, Bartlett being kind of a, rest, uh, a West Tennessee representative, if you will. Um, so, uh, so these were felt to be pretty representative of the market facing um, the city of Jackson. Uh, in terms of public safety, I know that uh, you, you are competing with many of these cities in, in, in Middle Tennessee for, for police and fire, um, and certainly for engineering. I know you know, city engineer came from Spring Hill, so. Um, a lot of these cities um, are comp competitive competitors for, for talent. So that's a public sector database. Uh, we also have a general business and industry database. Um, I would suggest that most employees who leave the employment of the city of Jackson, probably most, don't go to another city government or county government. Um, there's likely to go to healthcare, retail, manufacturing, contractor, Whoever, um, public safety tends to go to other uh, public safety or you know other municipalities or county governments. But even in the case of uh, police, we're seeing a lot of movement out of law enforcement into other professions. Host of reasons because of, you know leading to that. But um, but you know by and large, you're, you're competing with all industries in the Madison County area. So we felt it important to look at that data as well. We have a database that has 4,000 job titles in it. It's updated quarterly, um, and we can hone in on the Madison County area. Um, so we can match almost every city job to one or two do jobs in this database as well. So any questions on the database, the set of benchmarks? All right, so what we do then is we take, uh, for most jobs, we'll have the two numbers, the, the market median, middle of the pay rates, if you will, from the, the, the public sector benchmarks, and then the same uh, median from the general business da database, and average the two, come up with a market rate for each job. Not necessarily the person, but for each job. And as I mentioned, this, this market rate typically represents somebody with 
oh, five to seven years of time in the job. So most employers will hire new folks below the market rate for the job, if you will. Um, traditionally, historically, that's been around 80% of the market average. Um, our more recent pay plans have been starting out more probably closer to 85% of the market average for the uh, entry level step one pay range minimum, if you will. Um, and then most employers will allow pay to progress beyond the market average to as much as market average plus 20%. That's again a pretty traditional standard approach to pay management. Um, employers are willing to, to compensate for service, loyalty, <coughs> performance, whatever you want to call it, up to a limit that limit being about 20% or so, sometimes a little bit less uh, above the market average. Okay, any questions on how we determine the market rate for each job? Did you look at, oh. uh, in this comparison, did you, do we strictly look at pay, pay rate? Do we look at any benefits that were associated with that? Um, a benefits comparison is not part of the scope of the work. Um, I will say that we do that quite frequently, and um, most of the time, uh, a city or county's benefits package is, is, you know, they have some weaknesses and strengths. They kind of all kind of cluster together in terms of being what they look like to the employee and to the employer. And there's a few that are out there, you know, if you've got an employer that, I, and I have a couple clients that, uh, the employee pays nothing for individual or family coverage for health care. They pay nothing. Uh, it's a question if that's sustainable or not, but that's what they're doing. Uh, I conversely, once in a while, we'll come across a city or county government where the pan benefits package isn't quite as generous as the market. So um, in the former case where you have a very generous benefits package, again, in case one case we did this, we actually went ahead and targeted the, the salary market below average. Thought, well, we've got this great benefits package. We don't have to be as generous on the salary side. So we did that with uh, a couple of clients we've done that with. Um, I don't know if I've had any that uh, the benefits package was, uh, yeah, if the benefits package isn't up, up, up to par, then you're certainly going to at least be targeting the market average as far as salaries. But, but that information is not. No, no, we didn't really look at that. Okay. So to understand it, your benefits package is pretty good. Okay, so findings. Um, overall, uh, it's, it's, it varies from job to job, department to department, but one could say that overall your current employee salaries are about 7% this, this market average for the job. Some are, there's a few that are above the market average, but more that are <coughs> a little bit below and some further below. So actually half the employees are less than 85% of the market job average for their job. And uh, about half are ab above 99% of the market. So <coughs> half the people, or current pay rate is between 85% of market and 99% of market. So overall, you're, you're not in terrible shape. Sometimes when I do this, you know, the num top number is like 13 or 14% below market. It's not that. You're, you're, you're in the ballpark. Um, overall, it's just that you have a fair number of people that's half below 85% of market. That's probably a concern. Those folks are probably, by most measures, underpaid, unless they were hired within the last year or so. And some of them are, so it's appropriate, as I mentioned, most employers start new folks out at 80 85% of market. So half those people that are below 85% of market, some of that's fine because they've been hired last month, a year ago. You know, that's, that's okay, but if you've got people with five, six, seven years in position being paid 15% below the, the job market average, that's, that's probably not competitive and you're in danger of losing those folks. Any questions on this? I have a quick question. Yeah. Were you able to determine which type of jobs um, reflect that 7% below market rate? Um, You got to switch this. Our IT has to switch back between back and forth. So the, the current address is that. I apologize for the small print. <coughs> uh, 
um, if you looked at this column labeled salary market index here, mm -hmm. that is the average by department of each employee's salary divided by that market average. So in the case of the recorder's office, on average, the uh, salaries of people in the recorder's office were 89% of the market average for the job. So that's just broken down that's, by yeah, department. By department. Now, Not in terms of jobs, job. it, 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 it actually, as a, I guess it's a very gross generalization, but the higher the job that you reported with a hierarchy, probably the lower the market index. Again, a gross overgeneralization. Um, exception to that, certainly, but um, kind of a general observation was that your department heads, some of your senior level professionals, the those who are in the job, compared to this comparison group, right. were actually a little bit lower than than is the case in, in some of the lower levels. Um, but I offset that by the comment that uh, most employers that I'm dealing with, the most problematic in terms of recruiting and retention are groundskeepers, heavy equipment operators, laborers, um, parks and rec, uh, maintenance people, building maintenance. That's actually where most employers are having problems recruiting, throw in you know, fire and, or police and fire to a certain extent as well. But um, so. Uh, but then, then very quickly, does that have to do with the salary level? I think we're kind of drilling down to what, what's my. Point. So yeah, recruiting and retention isn't only about salary, obviously. Sure. Um, but uh, if you can't get people to even apply for the job, that's what I'm seeing in some places because the starting rates of pay are so low that they can't even get a, an applicant pool. Right. Um, that's a real problem. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, now when it comes to retention, uh, pay is up there in terms of why somebody will stay employed with an employer, but may not even be number one. It's the relationship with my boss, my coworkers, the work being performed, am I getting a chance to learn new and different things? Those are often just as important, if not important, than pay itself. Uh, but, but pay is up there on the list, sure. so um, it, it is, is up there. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but if you kind of look it through does. the- Thank you very much. If you look through the, the departments here, you can kind of see, if you look at that salary index, that you know, some are better than others, but um, uh, you know, it kind of gives a, a little bit of a flavor for that. Other questions on what we've covered so far? I think, see, Councilman, one of the sheets that I sent out, there's a breakdown of the individual positions and it shows you on one of the columns the where they are to start out of the of the labor market 85 75 right. so yeah okay. Okay. okay thank you yes all right so recommendations um and we've been working with with miss miss henning and, and the mayor and, and, and bobby and trying to come up with something that seems to make sense um we're, we're suggesting a, a, a pay structure comprised of 15 pay grades here. So 15 pay grades, or 14, excuse me, 14 pay grades. Uh, no, no, 15 pay grades. Yeah, yeah, 15 pay grades up and down. Seven grades up and down by letters, generally by letters. 15 pay grades. So jobs would go into one of these pay grades. And then each pay grade has 14 pay steps going across. Steps would would be annual steps. They're two and a half percent per year. So as long as somebody is meeting some minimal performance expectations, their salary would be adjusted one step each year. That's how it's proposed here. Now, once in a while, we'll have some clients that take, in this case, maybe steps 12, 13, 14. Those might be turned into biannual steps, kind of slow down people as they get more and more above the market average, but um, right now we're suggesting uh, two and a half percent steps. Um, step 14 is is, four, is 38% above step one, so we didn't quite make it to 40 or 45, or so um, it, it's a somewhat conservative number of steps, I guess you could say, so I'm inclined to say let's take everybody two and a half all the way up to step 14. Step six, you know, it's one of the step six that is highlighted there. The step six uh, notation is, is shaded out. I consider that, we're considering that to be the market 
step for the job. So what happened is, uh, I mentioned we, we have to get a job assigned to each pay grade, so how do we do that? So what we do is we take the market rate for the job, compare it to the step six column, and find the step six that's closest to that market average for the job. That's the pay grade the job goes into. So for example, let's say we came up with a job that had a pay rate average, market average of $19.50. Um, look at the step sixes here, and uh, the closest one would be grade E, 2029, the VF, FF, those are fire, so ignore those for a minute, but grade E, has a uh, step six of 2029, so that 1950 average probably is closest to that one. The job would go in grade E. So from that point forward, uh, all employees in that job would see these pay steps as their pay opportunity. So jobs that are valued about the same in the marketplace all end up in the same pay grade. Jobs that are valued differently in the marketplace earn different pay grades. So any question on how we got jobs into the pay grade? Are you, are you recommending a, you, you said that these steps would be based off of like annual performance reviews? Yeah, usually, even if you don't have a robust, you know, pay for, pay for performance <laughs> management system and most public sector organizations don't, but you all have some minimal expectation for performance. And so what I'm suggesting is if you've got somebody who's not performing at least at a minimal level, don't give them a step. You know, you would withhold the step until such time as maybe they rectified the performance issues. Some will say, hey, you lose out this year, you have to wait till the next year. Um, that's kind of a policy thing that we'll have to work out with you. But yeah, it's, it sends the wrong message to give an employee who's on the, on the border of being acceptable to give them an increase that kind of tells, hey, you're okay. When in fact, uh, if the performance issue is, is there, it's not okay. The other thing we recommend is that, the um, question is, well, what about top out? What happens if I reach stop, step 14? What happens then? Um, so somebody who, who is at, whose pay rate has progressed to step 14, that there's no other step to go to. So in lieu of a step, best practice, our experience has been, is best practice is to in lieu of a step, they would get a lump sum increase equal to, in this case, 2.5%. So there's always some skin to the game, if you will. It's not like I'm not working for anything anymore. I'm, I'm topped out. No, there's this opportunity to earn this bonus or not uh, based on meeting the performance, the minimal performance expectations. Um, so that's kind of best practice uh, for, for somebody who's, who's topped out. The other thing to keep in mind is that this set of steps and should be adjusted periodically. Uh, we're suggesting most of our clients should look at it every other year, every two years, look at the set of steps. You don't have to hire us to do a big fancy pay study, but um, somehow take a, uh, an assessment of the marketplace and see how your steps are stacking up and adjust them accordingly. So I do have clients that will have me do a pretty short review every two years and say, Steve, compare our steps to a handful of jobs, tell us what you think. Yeah, you need to move all your steps to 2% or 1% or whatever. Keep pace with the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So that, that needs to happen. You can't let this sit here for five years. You know, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have trouble, especially at the bottom end, because step one will, in all likelihood, not be competitive after five years if you don't adjust these things. Other questions on the pay structure itself? How we got jobs into the pay grade? Oh, I should mention we did, when we ran the numbers, um, there were quite a few people who would have to go to this, let's go back to this, go back to this sheet here. Um, there were quite a few employees who were, who were actually below the proposed step one. Um, it would cost a lot of money get everybody to step one. So as an interim easing into this kind of a thing, we suggest uh, implementing a, a temporary step one A, um, that some of these people who sold, who are so far below step one, they would go to step one A first, 
and ideally that step would go away after 12 months or so, and then you know, you'd, you'd use step one to 14 from that point on. But initially anyway, to get people kind of into this job table, or then this pay table, if you will, um, uh, we felt it prudent to uh, implement a step 1A to kind of ease those people into this that were so far below step one. So, salary adjustments. Um, and we've worked with the mayor and, and Lynn on this as well in terms of what would make sense. Um, uh, we, so this is, this is a, the, the proposal. Everybody will get at least a 3% pay adjustment. So all employees, all eligible employees, those hired after July 1, 2021. So you've, you have to have been with the, with the city at least a year, uh, you would get a 3% increase. Then after that, we would be adjust, adjusting each person's pay to the step one or step one A. It's a way below. Um, and, and, and or if people their current pay rate is already above step one, they would go to the step closest to their current rate of pay after the three percent adjustment. They would go to the step closest to that rate of pay, but not less. So this could be a fairly you know, small adjustment of cents per hour. If, if, if by luck your your three percent adjusted pay happens to fall pretty close to one of the steps for your for your job, um, it could be as much as you know two point four percent if your if your adjusted pay rate happens by luck to fall just barely above one step, but pretty far away from the step closest to, but not less. So, um, uh, but that's. How everybody's job, how everybody's pay would be adjusted. Everybody gets three percent. Then step one or one A. If you're below, if you're above that, you go to the step closest to the rate of pay, but not less. So in terms of results, um, this is a little bit different information for what you have, but uh, um, I calculated averages here. I think you may have a similar hand, a number in your in your handout, but. Um, I broke it out a little bit differently. So the, the, the everybody gets 3%. On the average, that's $1,351 per employee. Everybody gets that 3%, all eligible people hired after July 1, 2021. Um, there are 82 employees who are below the step 1A, pretty far below. And it would take $3,600 some uh, to get those people just to step 1A. Everybody else is going to step one or higher. Um, average increase for that group is $669. So um, some will be more, some will be a lot less. And then the total cost, this is in your handout, is $1.7 million and some change. This does not include impact on FICA or benefits, uh, retirement plan funding. So it's just salary impact only. Just a little bit more information to kind of flesh this out. Um, average total increase is $2,447. This is in your handout. Um, one quarter of the employees would get less than $1,654. One quarter of the employees would get more than $2,683. So that means about half the employees would get between $1,654 and $2,683. So the Corresponding percentages are average total increase is 4.7%. Half the people would get less than 3.3. Those are largely, largely people who get this 3% this increase and either aren't eligible for the uh, other adjustment or just a small adjustment to get to the step closest to their current rate of pay. Um, so half would, be half, would, half would be between 3.3% and 5.2%. So that means one quarter of the employees would actually get more than 5.2%. That's probably these 82 and uh, some of the ones that are just going to step one. Any questions on any of that? The, the step 1A employees, what is that primarily associated with? Um, let's see here. I can probably take a gander here. You don't have all this detail, I guess, but. Um, it's kind of spread across the departments. 
um, different levels. Um, probably your your more senior level positions it, actually it, for the most part, like I mentioned with before. The prior question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the city's done a pretty good job of keeping the lower pay rates uh, for lower job levels uh, pretty competitive. Um, but there's some of those that were uh, in this group too. Okay, thank you. Other questions on that? Okay. Um, so what, what, what's the result of all this? Um, the median salary market index, again, this is after all these adjustments, we take the employee's pay rate divided by the market average. We're now at 97% instead of 93, so we've made significant progress. Um, and I would argue that we're in pretty good shape. Some of those that are a little bit below are probably the new folks who have been in the job for a couple of years and it's appropriately, you know, it's appropriate that their pay rate is 85, 90% of market somewhere and that, that's fine because they've only been in the job for a few days, a few months, maybe a couple of years at most. Um, half are between 89% and 102%. So again, we're, we've tightened that up. Uh, so one could argue that most pay rates are, are in the ballpark. There's probably a, a, a few that are a little bit low in the 89, 90, 95% range if they've got six, seven, eight, nine years of experience in the job. Um, this approach hasn't fixed that, but you know, they're still a little bit low relative to uh, market given their experience. So when we first started this process, we had talked to the mayor and, and, and department heads about looking at trying to improve the linkage between job tenure and pay. Um, so that's something we're, you know, I've, I've <coughs> chatted with the mayor about, would perhaps look at, talk a little bit more about, and maybe a, a phase two kind of thing. We still have money in the budget to do some of that stuff. So um, that's something we may look at uh, as, as kind of a next year thing or whatever. But um, this does not really address the fact that you've got some people who've been in a job for uh, five, six, seven years and their pay is in the 90, 91% of market, you know, and it's probably a little bit low <laughs> given their tenure and position. Um, so there are maybe some ways to address that. How much you do of that is, is pretty much how many dollars can you allocate to it. But we're not in too bad a shape here with an average of, of about 97%. And, and to be clear, th mm -hmm. this uh, dozen plus list of cities, this is the market you keep yeah. referring to? Okay. Yeah. And, you know, again, that's seemed to be, you know, if we came, you know, if you were asked me to come up with a, a representative set of cities and counties, that, that's probably as good as we could come up with. You know, one could argue about this or that, but, you know, it's kind of, like I say, it's not like you're, you know, if we're in, in Brentwood, Tennessee, it's pretty obvious who the competitors are. You know, you don't have to go very far. Here it's a little bit of a challenge. Who are you, you know? Who are your competitors? Who's who's comparable? Who isn't? But that seemed to be a pretty good list. Of reviewed it with the mayor. And seemed to be pretty comfortable with that. Other questions? All right. Any other questions for Steve regarding the uh, process, the study, and the findings and the results? I guess I've already covered that one. I guess the one one thing that often comes up: What about cost of living? Um, Big question these days. Um, so our, our recommendation is that the employer track the cost of labor. It's not always the same. Up until 2019, 2020, they were about the same. Cost of living, cost of labor, we're moving pretty much in lock sync. Inflation maybe going at 3%, cost of labor 2.5%, 2 so they're pretty close. Um, we're, you're going to see that diverge as inflation takes hold and, and if, it's room for debate here, and who's, who's got the best crystal ball, but if uh, wage inflation, price inflation, uh, excuse me, price inflation continues in the four, five, six, seven, eight percent range, what are employers gonna do? Well, they're not gonna track, they're not gonna meet, they're not gonna match what you see in the newspaper as far as the, the COLA. I guess the last number I saw was 7.9% or eight, something like that. Employers are not going to match that. Um, right now in Middle Tennessee, they kind of are. They've kind of gone crazy. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, when we had inflation running 13% in 1980, 
em employers did not have 13% pay increase budgets. They were maybe seven or eight. Uh, so uh, how employers respond to the changes in cost of living remains to be seen. Uh, that's the cost of labor. We suggest you track that, not necessarily the cost of living. Um, you have to track what employers are doing and how they are responding to the cost of living. All right, any other questions for Steve? I'm going to call Bobby up because Councilman Taylor made a point on Thursday about the budget amendment um, for council to vote on. And so let Bobby present that information. So the council will recall that um, when you guys approved the FY23 budget uh, on two different readings that included in that budget was $2.5 million. Uh, that would, you know, it's kind of allocated between about, about $1.9 million and I'm rounding a little bit for salaries and about 600,000, a little bit less for the benefit impact. So $2.5 million, that was included in the budget. So that's, that, those funds are already appropriated. They're just in uh, an unallocated placeholder department at this point um, now that um, Steve has completed the study and has reported back um, to the council we would be in a position to um, uh, propose a budget amendment that would allocate the portion uh, to the various departments so there's one schedule in your report that actually has the salary number uh, on there we went ahead this morning and kind of quickly pulled together the the budget amendment that you have before you now, uh, which would uh, include the benefit portion as well. I would call your attention maybe on, on the second page, uh, maybe the third line from the total. This would actually leave about $267,247 in the unallocated salary line and related benefits of $91,606. So this would be, this budget amendment would be within the confines of what you all have already approved in total. It would just move it to the various departments based on the detail that's included in the implementation plan and the study that, that Mr. Topp just reviewed with you. Um, this uh, amendment, since it is not increasing the total budget and since it's not moving appropriated funds from one fund to another, in my understanding, would only require one one reading and uh mayor i believe i'm correct in saying the goal the target hopefully the goal is to implement this plan um such that the july 29th paycheck paycheck i believe would in, would in include the results of this plan so these unallocated funds they they'd sit in a in a separate fund they'd uh, stay in that line in that line item that's correct if, if need be throughout the year we can that's have correct. another single budget amendment that's to right. distribute those yes and am i correct uh that we're we're voting on a three percent increase so the the plan is a three percent increase and then if you look at the the really small table that you can't hardly see um to the next step of the 14 steps is what they're going to get. So they'll get the 3% and then the next step up to start them on the progression at 14. I move the approval. Second. second. We have a motion and a second for the approval of the budget amendment. Any further discussion? Hey, I'd ask Miss Henning real quickly if she could come up. Sending, how are you this morning? Uh, quite well, thank you. Uh, just, I know that this has been uh, a, a 
year-long process that we've been kind of going through, which started with uh, some individual department raises um, last year, and now it's culminated in this, uh, in this study. Uh, do you see any issue uh, with what's being proposed right now? I know that th there was kind of a domino effect that happened last year. Uh, I, I just want to make sure that as we move forward with this, that we're mitigating any potential domino effects in the future. I don't see any issues with it. Okay, thank you. None. I appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate the question. All right, any other discussion or questions? Uh, Mayor, if, if I could <clears throat> just clarify the budget amendment. Um, we pulled this together uh, quickly uh, this morning, and uh, the information from the report that I have, the information is available that we need. The point I'm trying to make is there are some departments uh, that are listed on the schedule at, at a level where there are call centers that roll up to that particular department, right? So um, I just wanted the council to be aware that when we post the actual budget amendment, a good example, I'll, I'll just use one of my areas, so uh, the recorder's office. So I believe there's probably, there's two departments. There's the recorder's department, and then there's the revenue office, for instance, that roll up to that one line item. I just wanted to be clear that we'll be uh, allocating the dollars at that detail level. Okay. That's, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Any other discussion, question from council? Council, please vote. Motion passed seven to zero. All right. Thank you all. Thank yeah. you for your work on this. All right. Item three is consideration of a contract for lawn care services at Riverside Cemetery. So moved. We have a motion. Second. And a second. Any further discussion? <laughs> Council, please vote. <laughs> Item four. Motion passed seven to zero. Financial empowerment quarterly report. Good morning. I will be brief because you can all read and you don't need me to read it to you or for you, but I put this report in front of you. Um, we had discussed during the quarterly report, we may move that to semi-annual or annual just to be more efficient and it'll be more effective that way. You'll be able to see more of an impact. But um, as we discussed, the Financial Empowerment Center soft launched in January and then did a public launch in March. Since that time, they've seen over 43 unique clients, had 133 sessions. Those clients have achieved 45 milestones, which means they're making steps toward these outcomes, which are outlined in the report um, of opening a safe and affordable bank account, reducing debt, building savings, things like that. 14 outcomes completed, over $63,000 in savings built collectively, which is amazing. And then there's um, about close to $3,000 that they've reduced in collective debt thus far. So we are pretty on track according to um, the Cities of Financial Empowerment with other financial empowerment centers that have started that are early in early stages. Really proud of our two counselors and our manager. Um, Sarah Beth is here. So if you all have questions afterwards and you want to snack her, I've asked her to stay seating because she's got a medical issue right now that she's working through. But um, they've done great work. We're looking at possibly adding a third counselor that can go out to sites because right now they're seeing um, clients virtually or in the office, most of them being referred from partner agencies like the Jackson Housing Authority. The rest of the report has some other um, initiatives that we're working on, but I'll, like I said, I'll be brief and let y'all read through that. But any questions on the impact? Any questions from council on the, on the report? Lauren, uh, not necessarily related to the portal. What do you think the capacity is? We adding some staff and you know, how many people total do you think we can have in the program at one time? So the goal that they're working towards is having 300 sessions a year. So we're about halfway through, so we're on track with that, um, which that could mean, again, like that could be multiple sessions with one client. So we would like to grow it, honestly, to have a regional scope um, because we know that Jackson is a little bit unique and that we don't just serve Jackson and Madison County, but we have a lot of people coming in and out. And so our hope would be that we take it from the 60,000 people that we serve here and expand more. So I don't really have a number of like clients, but I know number of sessions. The goal is around 300. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you have the thanks. questions for Lauren. All right. Okay, thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Item five is proposed budget amendment, American Rescue Plan fund, the amount of zero dollars. So moved. I have a motion. Second. And a second. Any further discussion? Council, please vote. <coughs> Motion passed seven to zero. 
All right, item six, consideration of a resolution to approve community development annual action plan 2022-2023. got up to let you out and then sat back down. <laughs> Good afternoon. Okay, so this action plan and budget represents the third year of our five-year consolidated plan. Uh, normally, we would present this plan in May. It's normally, excuse me, in April. It's normally due in May. However, you know, the federal budget uh, approvals were delayed, so we just received our allocations in May, so our plan is due by July 15th to HUD. Uh, we've uh, done the necessary citizen participation process. We held a 30-day public review period, a public uh, meeting. Um, in this plan, this year, our community development block grant funds, we're going to receive $556,070. That's about a 10% decrease from last year. On the home funds, we're receiving $374,898. That's an increase of 10%, or 34000 on the CDBG side, uh, we are going to fund pretty much our same agencies as last year um, under Public Services, West Tennessee Legal Services, Southwest Workforce Investment Act Program, RIFA, uh, Boys and Girls Club, and we're going to do our minor repair programs uh, in-house and through JCL, Jackson Center for Independent Living. I will note that uh, the Section 108 loan repayment uh, makes up about 44% of our CDBG allocation this year. That's $243,000 budgeted for that. On the home funds, uh, home funds are strictly for housing activities, and so we're going to fund $250,000 to our community housing development organizations. Normally, that's Jonah Affordable Housing and Southwest CDC, but this year to help to increase the supply of housing and quality of housing in the, in the city uh, through new construction or acquisition and rehab, we have added Habitat for Humanity to also help us with that. Um, and then we will have our in-house tar target housing rehabilitation program. So you have any questions on our plan? All right, any questions from council? Right, is there a motion for the resolution? So moved. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Council, please vote. Motion passed seven to zero. Thank you. All right, item seven, budget amendments less than 10,000. That was Sunshine to Council. Item eight, consideration of invoices over 10,000. So moved. Have a motion. Second. And second. Any further discussion? Council, please vote. <laughs> motion passed six and one abstain. If no further business coming before the council, meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 What's your finger?